Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we are graced by the presence of Dr. Rue Vandergrift, queer scientist, illustrator, and producer of the forthcoming documentary film, Marrow of the Mountain. Rue received his doctorate in mycology from the University of Oregon's Institute of Ecology and Evolution, doing much of his dissertation work on the ecology of fungi at Los Cedros in Ecuador. He has published peer-reviewed research in internationally acclaimed journals such as Microbiome, Biotropica, and the Journal of Tropical Conservation Science. Most recently, he was awarded a National Geographic Explorer Grant to coordinate a multidisciplinary international expedition to expand knowledge of the biodiversity at the Los Cedros Biological Reserve. To me, Rue is a true champion of biodiversity, both in terms of his research and his activism in protecting biodiversity hotspots like the Chaco region in Ecuador. Rue, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is great. It's great to be able to talk about these things uh, to people who want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. And I think, as we were just talking before the show, it's something that everyone needs to hear. And we really need to be aware of the threat that some biodiversity hotspots are under and how important it is to keep these mm -hmm. places intact, especially we're going to talk about the region in Ecuador. It's one yeah, of the most... Choco bio region. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, and it's been, I feel so privileged to be able to, to work there, you know, to interact in that ecosystem because there's so little of it left. The Choco is, it's kind of this western side of the mountains in northern South America up into uh, Central America. You know, it's this combination of elevation, the mountains, um, and consistency of the seasons in the tropical climate with the moisture that comes in off the Pacific Ocean that really gives this zone such incredible biodiversity. Uh, it is one of the top 10 hotspots for biodiversity in the world uh, and one of the most threatened in the world. It's a really important ecosystem to, to think about protecting for, you know, not just you know, selfish means, but from a global perspective. You know, we will need that biodiversity going forward uh, as climate changes, as the world shifts. It's going to be really important to have those reservoirs of biodiversity. I'm learning more and more about that intrinsic value of biodiversity. It also does have, as a human being, a selfish component. That biodiversity and that incredible abundance of different organisms hide away some key compounds, some key answers in terms of when you think of biomimicry and Absolutely. how these organisms have adapted to live. So there's like that selfish reason we need to keep this biodiversity here because this is going to eventually some secret that's going to save us is locked in that tapestry of organisms. Oh, absolutely. You know the phrase ecosystem services, right? I don't think I've heard that one. Oh, interesting. Let's break it okay. down. So let's break it down. So this is a teaching moment, as we like to call them in, in teaching, I guess. You mentioned an intrinsic value to this biodiversity, and that's sort of the value it has in existing. You know, everything that's alive has some intrinsic value, right? Like you can't put like a dollar amount on it. It's just it's valuable because it has a right to exist. Um, right. The, the kind of the other side of that coin is an extrinsic value, right? A value that it has to something else. So ecosystem services are the way we put dollar amounts on ecosystems. Things like, you know, you think about when you breathe, you use oxygen from the air and you exhale carbon dioxide back into the air. And that carbon dioxide is then sort of, you can imagine it as the inverse of breathing. It's photosynthesized by plants, right? The plants pull in the carbon dioxide and they, and they expel oxygen as a waste product, right? Two sides of the same coin. That photosynthesis providing oxygen for the atmosphere, that's an ecosystem service, right? Without plants in an ecosystem, the service would no longer be provided. One that's really, there's been a lot of research done to kind of really value uh, is pollination. You know, when you, when wow. you plant your garden, right, you don't really think about specifically pollinating every plant. It just kind of happens. Yeah. The service that the ecosystem around you provides, even an urban ecosystem can provide that service to some extent. And it's, it's an ecosystem service that is currently valued 
at something like $577 billion annually. And that seems even too low. I mean, when right? we think about how valuable that is. Yeah, $577 billion annually. You know, and it's kind of like, what would it cost if you had to pay somebody to go out and pollinate all the crops by hand every year? And then it just balloons from there. You know, you think about like clean water. We take clean water for granted in the United States. You know, I just came from, from Ecuador where, you know, you can't drink the tap water in the cities. But where we work in the Choco Rainforest, everybody who lives there, hands in the stream, it's so clean. I drink from the stream sometimes. Probably shouldn't. In general, like this water, because of the pristine state of the of the ecosystem where we work up near Los Pedros, that water is so clean. And it's not just people who live like within that forest. It provides the water downstream, right? It's a cloud forest. We call it cloud forest because it's in this cloud condensation zone. And so the wet air comes up off the ocean. It comes up the mountains and it cools down as it rises. And the clouds condense. And there's an elevation where the forest is just always encased in cloud. That's where Los Cedros is. That's where this Choco bioregion is in the cloud forest. And because of that, uh, it serves as the water source for all these major rivers. And it's not just people who live in the cloud forest. It's everybody downstream that depends on that water. It's an mm-hmm. ecosystem service that if you clear these forests, it's a self-perpetuating loop. Part of what makes these forests so spectacular is in the cloud forest, all of the trees are just dripping with epiphytes, these little like orchids, bromeliads, ferns, covering every branch of every tree. Every plant is just like there's other plants all over everything. It's just like this crazy dense, you know, it's incredible. And part of the reason for that is because they're able to access condensation from these clouds. So you can have plants living on a tree branch with no roots in the ground that are still able to get plenty of water because they sieve it out of the air. So when the clouds blow through the forest, about 60%, more than half, of the water that reaches the ground doesn't fall as rain. It's sieved out of the clouds by the vegetation. And so when you cut these forests down, the clouds just blow over the mountains and the water doesn't come. You change the ecosystem. You change the climate dramatically by removing the forest. The forest is part of a self-perpetuating climate loop. And And it's an extremely intricate system that has developed for so long to have these specific effects. I don't know. Exactly. It's impossible to express how important it is to protect that because we could not remake that. I mean, human beings Mm -hmm. could not remake such a perfect system. So you just set the table beautifully for the importance of protecting biodiversity, both for the intrinsic value, but also invaluable ecosystem services that we're relying on to live which most people are totally unaware of you know the reason this is such an issue that that conservation is such an issue is because the nature of ecosystem services are that they're silent you know they're unvalued right now how did you get into this work how did you get into biodiversity conservation Uh, and then we can get in how did you find yourself in ecuador doing a lot of this work. Tell us a little bit of that, a little bit of that origin story of Rue. You know, the answer to both questions is is kind of the same, actually. Let's see, where to start. I got my undergraduate degree from Virginia Tech. I'm from Virginia. I grew up in the mountains. Poor family, got a degree, paid for it myself. Wasn't really sure what to do next. But while I was an undergraduate, I did a lot of work as a, a technician in a biology lab doing sort of forest soil ecology, uh, soil nutrient dynamics and that kind of thing. And I really liked it. So after after college, you know, I worked at a biotech company doing some medical kind of stuff for a little while. Didn't really like it very much. And so I ended up going back to work at a university as a, a technician in a soil science lab at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And in that lab, I worked specifically with the spores of mycorrhizal fungi, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, from high alpine soils in Mongolia. It's really strange. That was where they did their field work. Sadly, I never got the chance to go do field work in Mongolia with that. Oh, that was my next question, if you got uh, to go to Mongolia. No, I did get to do a summer of plant demography field work in Utah with that lab, which was really fun. I spent like about a year, Brenda Casper's lab, 
she's great. And she taught me so much. I went into it because I had enjoyed working with soils uh, as an undergraduate. But by the time I finished in that lab, what I realized that I was most interested in was the idea of symbiosis and the effects of symbiosis on ecosystems in, in sort of a broad sense. So I came to graduate school. It's what brought me to Oregon to work on symbioses. Uh, and I didn't really know what that meant. You know, I think nobody, I don't think anybody really starts a PhD program with a, an understanding of what it's going to be like. That's the, that's the journey. That's the journey, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's the hardest, most intense thing I've ever done in my life. And I, you know, I'm proud of myself for having done it. <laughs> you know, six years, six years of your life for those three letters at the end of your name, Rue Vandegrift, PhD, but they can never take it away from you. Wear it with pride. Yeah. Yeah. It was, oh man, what a thing. You know, when I started it, I said, you know, I don't know what, what it's going to do for me in my life, but I feel like the process is going to be good for me. In hindsight, I think that was true. I'm not 100% sure what it's going to do for me, but I think the process was good for me. <laughs> so I joined um, Dr. Biddy Roy's lab at the University of Oregon, and I, I started out working with our buscular mycorrhizal fungi in grasslands, just like I had been doing as a tech with yeah. in Philadelphia. I did about a year of work working with local grasses in the grasslands of the Willamette Valley in Oregon, and their fungal partners. Uh, Our buscular mycorrhizal fungi are not what everyone thinks of when we think of mycorrhizal fungi. Oh, that's so, true. through my own education, when I started learning about mycorrhizal fungi, it really blows you away to realize, yeah, there are great ectomycorrhizal fungi that partner with trees. Those are those delicious edible mushrooms we see, like the porcini, the chanterelle. Mm -hmm. Then there's this exactly. whole group of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that, as far as I understand, are more of the fungi that are critical in maintaining both tropical plants, uh, plant families like grasses. So there's this whole unseen, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they don't typically have big macro fungi, big fruiting bodies, but they are ubiquitous and absolutely oh. everywhere. I mean, when we see grass, we don't think of fungi. Exactly. No, and it's, but it's so crucial. I'm going to give them a name. They call them glomeromycetes. It's the, the class. And there, for a little while, they were glomeromycota, a whole phylum. The taxonomy's been shaken up uh, a lot in the last few years on these basal lineages. So these are old. These are fungi that evolved um, around the time that plants first colonized land about 400 million years ago. Uh, and you hear the statistic pretty regularly. 90% of land plants have mycorrhizal symbioses. Right. Uh, and what you don't hear after that is that 90% of those are arbuscular mycorrhizae, not wow. ectomycorrhizae. Wow. Okay. The vast majority of land plants have associations with arbuscular mycorrhizae. And there's a handful, uh, alder trees being one example, that have both. There's a guy named Peter Kennedy at University of Minnesota. He has done a bunch of cool work with the multiple symbioses of alder trees, ectomycorrhizal fungi, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and nitrogen-fixing bacteria all together in the same roots. Alder trees are kind of like these bio-cyborgs that have a whole ecology oh, within their root system. Absolutely. Yeah, alder trees are really cool. There's, a, there's an open access paper on PRJ called this Mixed Checkerboards. It was kind of one of the big foundational papers from him. Uh, so check that out. But yeah, so, Fantastic. so glomeromycetes, <laughs> you bring it back. So I was working with these, these soil mycorrhizal fungi. They don't make mushrooms. They make these weird spores. They've been, as far as anybody can tell, they've been totally asexual in their reproduction for millions and millions of years. I'm working with them in these grasses and I'm realizing that like, you know, these aren't the only fungi in these grass roots. There's also all these, what they call dark septate endophytes which are highly melanized fungi that infect the roots and people have thought were parasites, but it actually turns out serve kind of a mycorrhizal role. Um, and then there's this systemic endophyte of the, the tissues of the grass above ground called uh, epichloe or what we call clavicipitaceous endophytes. And these are in the same group of fungi as cordyceps. And those are endophytes in living the, within the grass. In the grass uh, stems and leaves. They're well known because they cause some diseases of livestock. If you ever hear about like a drunken crazy horse disease, a drunken horse disease, it's because the grasses have this clavicipitaceous endophyte that creates these neurologically active chemicals that makes the horses act like they're drunk. 
Um, and also keeps, in general, it keeps herbivores from eating the grass. So it's a form of mutualism. It's a symbiosis. The fungus gets food and a place to live from the plant and in exchange provides defensive chemistry. So it creates all these, uh, all these chemicals that like insects and animals don't like to eat. Um, Fungi so are so illustrative of symbiosis. So you're talking about you wanted to do your work just diving into that biological concept of symbiosis. Of course, you'd end up researching fungi because they are like the embodiment of that, or at least for what we understand so far. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. The, so, the symbioses in fungi, I mean, there are symbioses all across life, right? Right. Uh, but in, in fungi, they're so integral to the evolution and ecology of the fungi. And so, yeah, so I started with these grasslands. That was really fun. I learned a whole lot. I did some cool things. And it got me really, it shifted my focus from mycorrhizae to endophytes. And then from there, this is the answer to what took me to Ecuador. My lab that I had joined was already working at Los Cerros. I joined the lab in 2010. They'd been working down there since 2008. So just a couple of years before I got there uh, with Bryn Dentinger, who for a little while was the head mycologist at Kew. He's now at Utah. Bryn actually came into the lab as a postdoc, um, specifically with the intent of working in that part of Ecuador, because there's an orchid, uh, the genus of orchid, Dracula, something like 300 species of Dracula, and their center for diversity, orchids are super diverse, but the center for Dracula diversity is right where Los Cedros is. And in fact, the type species of many of the, the most interesting species of Dracula are from Los Cedros. Wow. Okay. So, and what makes Dracula's really cool is all orchids have this inner petal called a labellum. That's mm-hmm. like the really flashy, like weird shaped petal that all orchids have, right? And it's super different and super in lots of orchids because there's been this crazy evolution of orchids in the last, you know, like million years or so. And so these particular orchids, Dracula orchids, that lower petal is shaped like a gilled mushroom. Wow. Okay. So doing a little biomimicry to attract certain insects or? Exactly. And so that was the thought. Everybody had assumed this is a mimicry system and it's being pollinated. It must be pollinated by mushroom visiting flies. Right. Right. And so, but nobody had ever tested it. So Bren and Biddy, they wrote a little grant. They actually started out with seed funding from National Geographic, just like our grant was. And then they ended up getting a National Science Foundation grant. And they did uh, a bunch of work on this mimicry system. There's now been a bunch of papers published. One of the lead scientists involved in that work was my colleague Tobias Policha, who's a botanist. He worked, he was uh, Biddy's PhD student at the time. He was a PhD student who was like really working on that project. You know, they did so much to really determine what is going on with this mimicry system. Because mimicry, there's, you know, mimicry is complicated biologically. They ended up working with this guy, David Grimaldi, who's the world expert on drosophilid flies, so fruit flies, to work on the, the pollination of these orchids. Uh, and they ended up collecting literally thousands of flies, growing flies from orchids and mushrooms and doing all these like visual behavior experiments with these flies. Basically, they found out that, yes, the orchids really are pollinated by flies that are attracted to them because they look like mushrooms. Not only do they look like mushrooms, they produce the same volatile chemicals that make mushrooms smell like mushrooms. Oh, that's important. Not only yeah, is it visual, but they're outputting that factory. same chemical compound. Wow. Right? It's fascinating. So that's what brought me to Ecuador. Is My lab was working on these mushroom-mimicking orchids. And to do that, they had to do mushroom surveys. Because if, if you say, okay, here's the mimic, what's the model? Is it a generalized mushroom or is it a particular mushroom? Uh, and so I came down to help with these mushroom surveys, and it was basically the last year of the big grant. My advisor, Biddy, she's like, well, we've got the funds to bring you down for the field season. You can help with the mushroom work, and you should design a little experiment, because why not? If you're in the rainforest, you know, you might as well. And that just totally derailed my PhD. Uh, I just... Des- <laughs> I wanted to design a little experiment that I thought was going to be relatively simple. You know, it turns out in science, nothing's simple. That's that's the first lesson you should learn if you want to be a scientist. Uh, Nothing's ever as simple as it looks. The work that was started in that field season was published in Biotropica, and it's it's that spatial ecology paper on the genus Silaria. And so my other advisor, 
uh, this guy, Dr. George Carroll. He's been retired for enough. He was retired the entire time I was doing my PhD. George came up in 1999 with this idea that he called the foraging ascomycete hypothesis, which you've probably never heard of. Nobody's I haven't. Heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was basically, it was this idea that some fungi are endophytes because they're foraging. They're looking for food that they actually want to eat. They're not endophytes because they want to eat the living leaf of the tree. They're not causing right. disease. They're not endophytes because they want to eat the leaf once it's shed. That would be what we call latent saprotrophy, where they're, they're just waiting so that they can eat it when it's dead. They're not doing that. They're endophytes because it's a way to diversify dispersal strategies. Think about a mushroom on a log. That the mushroom is the fruit of a fungus that's eating the dead wood, right? Its preferred food is dead wood. It makes a mushroom to disperse, to get its spores out into the world. But a mushroom on a log produces a whole lot of spores, usually in the millions, in a very short period of time. In the case of a mycena, a single day, in the case of Xyleria, which is what I work on, it can be up to a couple of months, but it's still not very long. Some of those spores are able to cause endophytic infections. They don't hurt the trees. They just hang out there until the leaves are shed. Now, in a tropical forest, you've mostly broadleaf trees, right? You know, think about like a an East Coast forest, right? Oaks and maples, that kind of thing. Except that in the tropics, there's no winter. So there's no time when they all shed their leaves at the same time. Those leaves stay on the trees as long as they're photosynthetically productive. Right. Which means at Los Cedros, the best estimate we've got right now is about two and a half years is how long a leaf stays on a tree. And then when it's shed, the fungus that's living within it can ride it down to the forest floor where all the dead wood that it wants to eat is. A mushroom is short duration, high density for spore dispersal. But endophytic infections in the canopy are really long duration, two and a half years, but really low density, one leaf every now and again. It's an opposite dispersal strategy. If there's no dead wood for them to eat on the forest floor, it lets them stay in the environment kind of as long as they want. And mushrooms are masters of adaptation. Uh, I've been learning, too, about some mycorrhizal fungi that may have multiple ways of gathering energy where their mycorrhizal potential is, is matched with something like saprobic potential. In something like morels, it's been thought that they might have a dual strategy there when it comes to getting yeah. energy. So it would make sense Absolutely. that... There are mushrooms that adapt dual strategies for reproduction. You know, they're, they're masters of adapting and having, you know, multiple strategies in play at once. I mean, just down from their, the idea of the form of mycelia, you know, where the hyphae are spreading in multiple directions at once, the, the organism is always trying multiple avenues at once. I guess, would you say a lot of the endophytic mushrooms that we find that is the reason why they are endophytic as a reproduction strategy or are a majority doing it to derive <laughs> energy or food like metabolites hanging out in the leaf or a mix of both or do we not know that is a, that's a great question i think if your question was the majority of endophytes i think the best answer to that is we don't know every fungus that you find as an endophyte is going to have a different kind of reason to be there right and just to be clear, I want to define endophyte here. When we say endophyte, yes. we mean a fungus living within a plant leaf that does not cause that plant disease. Right. Right. And so the big ones, it can be an endophyte that is what we call a, a latent pathogen. It's able to live within the plant leaf, but not trigger an immune response. It's not hurting the plant. It's hanging out and it's waiting for there to be a drought or for there to be an insect attack. Something that weakens the plant so that it can overcome the plant's immune system. That's mm -hmm. one reason. Another common reason is what we call latent saprotrophy, where saprotroph is to eat something that's dead. And so there's this idea in ecology called priority effects, where if you can be first, then you have pr the first access to these resources, and it gives you the option to guard those resources for yourself. And it changes the downstream eventual ecology of whatever that habitat is. 
this is a, a theory that was first worked out on lava flows, where when mm-hmm. a new lava flow comes in, whatever the plant species that colonize it first change the trajectory of the development of that ecosystem. Sure. The same thing is true in decaying plant matter. So if you've got a fungus that starts out in the living plant matter, it has the option of changing the trajectory of the ecology and the dead plant matter once it dies. So latent pathogenicity, latent saprotrophy, and then endophytism as a means of dispersal, what we call veophytism. Via meaning to go through and fight because of plants. So a veophyte is a fungus that is using a plant as a means of dispersal, a way to get around. This is one of the most mind-blowing types of fungi to me and almost everyone I talk to is the idea there are fungi latent in every single plant, every single grass. Where there is plant cellular material, there is fungi connecting with it, living inside of it. Now, is endophytic research relatively recent? I would, Im- and here's my theory, I would imagine it is because it must have been hard uh, prior to certain technological breakthroughs to sample out a fungi genetic material from plant genetic material, right? Well, you know, and actually the, the study of endophytes goes back to the time before fungi were typically studied with DNA. It was culture-based okay. studies. The initial work that, you know, because basically everybody thought like a plant leaf is part of a plant, like why would it have a microbiome? And right. now, so in a modern scientific context, we're like, oh, we have microbiomes, plants have microbiome, everything has a microbiome now. But nobody knew. And so really, this comes from the 1960s. Remember I mentioned that this idea of this foraging ascomycete hypothesis came from my mentor, George Carroll. Uh, well, he also happens to be the person who was responsible for discovering leaf endophytes. Wow, okay. That was work done with Bill Dennison in the 1960s at H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, which is run by the Oregon State University in Corvallis. H.J. Andrews is a really wonderful patch of old-growth Cascadian Douglas fir forest. If you ever get the chance to go there, it's great. But he was working on nitrogen cycling and lichens. They were working Mm -hmm. on, uh, there's these Loberia lichens that fix a lot of nitrogen, and then it washes down from the tops of the plants into the soil. And there's these little tiny fungi on the surface of the Douglas fir needles they're epiphytic fungi. And so he thought, well, these epiphytic fungi might be also fixing nitrogen. We should check. And then he had this thought, well, we should just, before we start growing out these epiphytic fungi, we should just make sure that we're not going to be contaminating it with anything from inside the leaves. So they surface sterilized. They used bleach and ethanol to just kill everything on the surface of these Douglas fir needles. And then they put them on growth media on plates, and they found an incredible abundance of fungi, hundreds of species. And every single needle that they sampled, they found at least one fungus growing out of it. That's mind-blowing to think how ubiquitous they are, and even just in your buildup of that example, to think there's (laughs) an epiphytic fungi on the pine needles themselves, the lichens, which are, I mean, that would be multiple podcast to discuss the incredible organisms that are lichens, the algal fungal constructs that are lichens. And then within each of the pine needles is at least one type of fungus up to dozens. I mean, their strategies have taken them throughout the tapestry of all living things. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that I like to, when I give talks, one of the first things I usually do, I show a picture of a forest, uh, a tropical forest in particular. And, you know, you say every green leaf you see, you can do this at home, you know, like look out your window you'll probably see some green leaves. <laughs> right. Every leaf you see is full of fungi, dozens yeah. of species. Even in the temperate zone here in North America, every leaf is just full of fungus because plants have a microbiome. You know, just like your gut is full of more bacterial cells than your body has human cells, yeah. plants have more fungal cells than they have plant cells. Living things are more defined by the populations of smaller living things living within them than they are as like one static being it's it brings you off into all these questions of what is really motivating the bigger organism when they have all these different things living in them especially with plants when you talk endophytes you know what is the chemical interplay is exactly exactly when you're thinking about the effect uh beneficial effects of plants even smells different things we attribute to plants how much of that is responsible 
by the fungi that's actually living inside it. And then from there, how much of that is responsible by the bacteria living in the fungi? Yeah. And you just start getting into this like waterfall effect of examining the microbiomes of all these organisms. It's oh, amazing. It gets so complicated so quickly. It takes so much work to really tease these things apart. There's a pretty famous example. Uh, there's a cancer drug called Taxol. I don't know if you've heard of Taxol. I have. Yeah. And it, yeah, it comes from Taxus, which is the genus for yew trees. Um, and so it was initially isolated from Pacific yew here in the Pacific Northwest. And early research indicated that maybe Taxol is not actually a product of the plant, but is a product of a fungal endophyte living within the plant. And there's been, at this point, I think millions of dollars invested in trying to grow endophytic fungi isolated from yew trees to produce taxol. And in the end, it turns out that that initial indication that it was an endophytic product yes. was incorrect. And it actually does come from the plant. <laughs> okay, so, so we can't paint with a broad brush and say that you know fungi are actually responsible for everything. No, plants, plants? <laughs> are responsible no, exactly. for some of these chemicals too. But it's equally like, you know, and this is the part that's still open to debate. It's quite probable that the plants may be creating this chemical, but they might not be able to do it without a fungal without partner. A fungal. And that kind of relationship has been demonstrated, uh, particularly in lichens, all the time. A lot of the really interesting chemicals that lichens make, usnic acid, uh, which is one of the active chemicals in usnia that has medicinal uses, mm -hmm. usnic acid, the fungus from usnia, can't make it without the algae. The algae can't make it without the fungi. It's a product that only exists in the symbiosis. And so when we're talking about Rue having to structure your own mushroom experiment to try to get to the, the heart of what are these orchids down in Ecuador mimicking, you're faced with all <laughs> these incredible complexities. Well, yeah. Well, and I, I never really worked on the orchid work. That was, that was Tobias's, okay. Tobias and Bryn and Biddy and, you know, it was a whole crew. So I came down and wanted to work with these endophytes. So what I did was I basically George, my other advisor, who had this idea for this foraging ascomycete hypothesis, you know, he told me about it and he's like, yeah, but there's not really any way to test it. And my little brain was like, wait a minute. I can see like a couple of ways to test this. And so that's a chunk of my career since learning about this idea has been devoted to testing this hypothesis. The big test, what we did was, you know, you're thinking if the fungi are dispersing into the leaves, there's a probabilistic relationship, but basically the closer you are to the mushroom, the higher probability you should have of dispersal. Right. Right. If you've got them in the, in the trees coming, raining down slowly leaf by leaf onto the wood, there's a dispersal relationship. My thought was if you look at the distribution in space, in the forest canopy as endophytes, yeah. and you look at the distribution in space on dead wood in the forest floor, if there is this dispersal relationship, you should see some correspondence in Absolutely. distribution. Is, is that hence the name spatial ecology? Spatial ecology is like the yeah. ecology of things in space. And so what we did is we took a half a hectare of forest. It's 100 meters by 50 meters. It's not very big. We made it into a grid. And we collected every xylaria we could find. For the North American listeners here, the xylarias that you might have seen are dead man's fingers, xylaria polymorpha, yeah. or candle snuff fungus, carbon antler, xylaria hypoxylon. Yeah, yeah, I love those. Yeah, right? These are our two common North American xylaria. There's a number of others in North America. But in Ecuador, the diversity is just off the charts. We surveyed half a hectare, right? 100 meters by 50 meters. And we found and identified 36 species of Xylaria. So for reference, the state of Oregon, the whole state, has five species of Xylaria native to the state, of which two remain undescribed still. Wow. So now you're faced with 36. 36. Are many of those endemic to that region of Ecuador? And Several seem to be endemic. Several seem to be undescribed. So right now we're working on a paper to describe some of the fungal biodiversity and then a, a separate paper to specifically work on the xylarias uh, from Reserva Los Cedros, where I work, which is a relatively small preserve. It's about 17,000 acres of forest, most of it pristine primary cloud forest habitat. We know of at least 50 distinct species of xylaria of which probably five or six are undescribed. And those undescribed ones are likely undescribed because they're endemic. They only right. occur 
in these small river valleys in the high Andes in Ecuador. That mirrors in plants, in animals, the high Andes, this part of the Andes in Ecuador, has incredible endemism because of the geology and the history of the region. It's a recent, what we call recent uplift. I mean, 36 species in just half a hectare. Oh, that's absurd. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, that just gets to that idea of how truly biodiverse Ecuador is. It's hard for us to conceive of that, but it really is that unique geography, that unique environment oh. leads you to a place where it's just exploding with all yeah. different attempts at life by, by multicellular organisms. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you I'll give you another illustration of the diversity for this part of Ecuador that yes. will help visualize. We love illustrations, uh, yes. So there was a working with uh, PrimeNet, which is a, a monkey conservation science group. Uh, they did this tree biodiversity survey. The Smithsonian does this all the time, where they, they lay out a permanent plot, and then they sample every tree with a stem bigger around than your thumb, and then they lay them out. And so this was done in a small plot at Los Cedros, one hectare plot. In one hectare, 100 meters by 100 meters, this is actually the same place we did our fungus survey, the survey uncovered 299 species of tree. No herbaceous plants. That's, no that's absurd. That's right? absurd. And so for comparison, do you know how many species of tree are native to Oregon? I don't want 50 or... 67. To the for entire the state. state. <laughs> about half of which are broadleafed and about half of which are conifers. We're talking about a forest where there are 300 species of tree per hectare. And if you go to the next hectare over, there'll some overlap, but largely you'll find different species. And what I'm blown away by is that idea that we're talking about the Los Cedros Bioreserve, which is part of this bigger Chaco uh, phytogeographical bioregion. Yeah. And within that Chaco bioregion, you have Los Cedros, you have different areas that have their own endemic species. Exactly. Now, the Choco bioregion, in addition to being one of the most, you know, having the highest percentage of endangered organisms and being one of the most threatened ecosystems, it has some of the highest percentages of endemic organisms to any yeah. bioregion on the planet. Again, because the, the Andes Mountains are a relatively recent, you know, rising up. Right. And that creates splits. You know, every mountain valley and peak isolates habitats. And so there's been a lot of recent evolution because of this recent isolation from each other. It's really difficult for gene flow to move up and down the spine of the Andes because of how the crenulated and and rocky it is you know you can't just make a straight line because there is no straight line well and it's that island effect we all know that exactly. islands are these areas of such incredible biodiversity because they are cut off like that and this is much the same so that was your dissertation work and it sounds like mm -hmm. that's still very much ongoing in parallel with some of these other projects absolutely absolutely so Last year, we did this, what we called the Richer Than Gold Expedition. So okay. this National Geographic and the American Orchid Society provided a big chunk of the funding, but then funding came from, you know, lots of different researchers brought bits and bobs of their own funding to it. And we ended up with about 20 researchers at Los Cedros. We tried to get everybody there at once, and then it's like herding cats, trying to get scientists to do right. anything. You know, we ended up with actually kind of two sub-expeditions with crews that came and left to like in staggered timing. But all told, we had herpetologists, we had primatologists, we had ornithologists, we had entomologists, we had mycologists, we had botanists. You know, we had this huge crew that organized to do biodiversity work at Los Cedros in collaboration because the Los Cedros Biological Preserve uh, was called Bosque Protector Los Cedros has been included in concessions to a Canadian mining company. No, I don't want to hear that. I know, right? So in 2017, and so this is how long this has been going on, uh, in 2017, the Ecuadorian government decided to shift its strategy for economic development uh, to really push mining. And the amount of land in Ecuador that was available to mining increased by 300%. And it was So they basically put all the available land kind of up for sale to mining companies. They exactly. So and it was closed door secret auctions where these concession they call the mining concessions. So in Ecuador the mineral rights to any piece of land are owned by the government. 
And so the government has the right to say, even on a, on protected land, this mining company can go in, explore for minerals, and if they find them, open a mine. And if it's your land, tough luck. This was something, another big question I had about the Ecuadorian landscape when it comes to academia and to government systems. Mm -hmm. Are there environmental protections already in place that can stop this? Or well, is it kind of wholesale, the government can sell whatever they want? Uh, you know, that old story of government corruption. To me, that's what it's sounding like. But I'm, is there a, is there a subtler relationship there where people are opposed to it in academia and government that you found? Oh, my God. It's, I'm glad you asked. It gets a little bit complicated. Ecuador is the first country to include explicitly rights for nature in their constitution. Wow. They right were on. And it was in 2008, the new constitution was adopted that included rights of nature. And it's pretty strong. Nature have rights in the same way people have rights. And that's really important. So remember that. We're going to come back to that. The other thing that that constitution did was give the government, which is representing the people broadly, the right to the resources of the land, like the minerals. So in the same stroke, the thing that gives nature rights also provides this kind of like a little it's a little bit nefarious and there has been corruption involved other than minerals other than mining in the mountains is oil in the amazon mm -hmm. and ecuador ecuador in 2008 after that constitution they pinned their economy on oil they did some really i mean it's it's, it's been contentious there's a documentary film called crude from like crude oil uh that deals with ecuador and oil it's really good highly recommend it and basically, these same kind of concessions for minerals that we're dealing with at Los Cedros, uh, those kind of concessions have been placed all over the Amazon rainforest on the eastern side of Ecuador, infringing on the rights of the native people that lived there, the indigenous people, and putting the these huge swaths of really sensitive lowland rainforest an incredible environmental risk. The largest oil spill in global history was in the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador. The largest settlement for any environmental case, uh, the largest settlement, excuse me, the largest judgment in any environmental case was for the Texaco oil spill in Ecuador. International courts have actually just recently ruled in Chevron's favor that Chevron doesn't have to pay Texaco's debts in that case. And there's a great mycology connection. The Amazon Micro Renewal Project has been working with Fungi to clean up that oil spill for more than a decade. Um, I've heard about the Amazon Micro Renewal Project, and there have been some really prominent figures in mycology that have all kind of been part of that project at one time or another. Yeah, the in bits and bobs, but really the mycologist that really was the nucleating factor, Mia Maltz, um, she got her degree from UC Berkeley a little bit before I did, uh, and she's phenomenal. She was the consulting mycologist with the Amazon Micro Renewal Project when it got started. Doesn't that word concessions, just such a great word to totally cover up the nefarious oh. intentions and the rapacious nature of that kind of wholesale it's, selling of nature? You know, the thing about this, this expense, because like, I'm not naive. I know Ecuador will mine. You know, like it's mining. right. Like you have to balance economic development in our current structure of how we use natural resources with preservation. Right. That's always going to be there. Exactly. And the thing that's the most nefarious to me is so Ecuador has protected forests and it's a system that, you know, every country has its own system. But you can really largely divide it into two sets of protected lands. There's what they call the snap lands. So there's this handful of these huge. I mean, we're talking like half a million hectare giant parks. Yasuni down in the Amazon is the most famous one. You've probably heard of Yasuni if you're, yeah. if you're into those kind of things. There's one just north of Los Cedros in the mountains called Cotacachi Cayapas. Those protected lands have not been touched by mineral or oil concessions for the most part. That's what Ecuador's government considers protected. Mm. There's a second class of protected lands called Bosques Protectores, which are called protective forests. The snap lands are owned by the government and managed by the government. Um, and often they're totally inaccessible. They're protected because they're huge blocks of wildlands. Bosque protectores, there's lots of different ways that lands end up as bosque protectores. But the total land area 
protected in these protected forests is about twice what is protected in this SNAP, this uh, okay. system of big, big preserves, yeah. even though they're largely smaller. They're mostly smaller portions. In the aggregate, bigger, but more decentralized. But more decentralized, exactly. And so Le- Los Cedros is one of those. And those are owned by the government, but privately managed. So mm-hmm. the Los Cedros Reserve is managed by Jose de Cou, who's been there since the late 80s. And he's actually an American expat who left when Nixon was elected. He was like, I can't do this anymore. He moved to Ecuador and has been an absolute bulldog protecting this forest for you know decades and decades now. Well, and it and, gives another layer there, right? Where not only in this one instance, it sounds like to me with the snap forest, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like the government says, yes, we are protecting this area of forest, but we also hold the rights to getting rid of it. So who's there to provide any kind of roadblock to doing whatever they potentially want to do with it? I mean, it sounds like they're protecting it now. Whereas when you have yeah. some private management like these Bosco Protectoris, you have kind of this watchdog middleman. I guess that could there's, be corrupted too, but and there's yeah, it's it pluses and minuses to the system for yeah. sure. You know, the before this huge expansion in mining in 2017, there was no land available in either class of protected lands for mining. Right after this expansion of mining, about a third of Bosque Protectores ended up under threat of mining. When we're talking about like I'm working on this movie and I'm working on other conservation focused work to preserve Los Cedros in the face of this threat of large scale mining, it's bigger than just Los Cedros. We're talking yeah. about a third of the protected forests in Ecuador, which by the numbers protect a larger percentage of endangered species, endemic species, rare species. These protective forests are incredibly important as protected areas. And the fact that the government you know, has decided in the initial court here. So, of course, Los Cedros has taken the government to court over this. You know, mm-hmm. We're a protected area. You can't put mining concessions on protected areas. That's the argument. And the initial court case, uh, we went to the provincial court in Imbabura, which is the, you know, it's kind of like saying the circuit court in the U.S. We made that argument. The representative from the Ministry of Environment, which is tasked with overseeing protected areas, said, and I quote, well, protected forests aren't protected areas. Let's play semantic game 101. Exactly. Yeah. Bosques protectores no son áreas protectores. What? Right? Yeah. So Los Cedros won that case. Wow. All right. That's the, good the, news. The mining company's permits for exploration. Over this period, the mining company had been sending in crews into the protected forest to do exploration work against the express wishes of the reserve manager and illegally because a protected forest has certain uh, sets of allowable activities and mining exploration is not one of them, right? right? So illegal exploration against the wishes of the reserve management, they had their permits removed. The mining company, it's a Canadian mining company called Cornerstone Capital Resources. This mining company continued working in the protected forest. And the mining company's argument is that, well, until the case is appealed, then, you know, we don't really know. But can you imagine that happening in the U.S.? Like, literally, the Ministry of Environment removed your permits. Like, right. you don't have permits to be doing this work. They're doing it anyway. So there's the legal framework to actually have some kind of regulatory body, but the regulations actually don't really have teeth. I mean, you can decide well, that, hey, exactly. you're you're violating the what we've dictated in the judicial system and from like this legislative framework of protected areas and nature having rights. But then when it comes to actually enforcing that on the ground. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, because enforcement comes down to the executive, like the government that's in power right now, Lenin right. Moreno's government. And Lenin Moreno's government is pushing mining as the solution to Ecuador's economic woes. The body of government that would say, hey, you can't do that. They're the ones that want mining to happen. I mean, to the point where they could station people there to say, turn your trucks around, you can't come in, would be my immediate thought. If you don't have permits, I mean, in the U.S. It's complicated by the fact that you can't get to Los Cedros by truck. You can only get there on foot or by mule. So the mining crews are actually, they started coming in the front door. 
with their mules and their equipment. You basically, there were people that said, no, you can't do this. And Fantastic. so they've been, they've been cutting trees, cutting down trees, which is very illegal in a protected forest to create new trails into the reserve from the other side to access where they're doing their mineral exploration. There's no way to police it really. The good news is there is good news in this. Last week, the case got picked up by the Constitutional Court of Ecuador, which is the high, it's like the Supreme Court in the U.S., yeah. specifically so that they can decide on setting a precedent about the role that the constitutional rights of nature have in bosques protectores, this class of protected land. That case, we don't know exactly when it will go to court, but hopefully soon, in the next couple of months, right. will determine the fate of mining concessions on millions of acres of protected land in Ecuador. So there's a lot riding on this decision, and I'm sure if their politics are anything like our politics, Cornerstone Capital Resources already has a million lobbyists roaming around the government down there trying to get everyone uh, who's anywhere near this decision to try to influence it and, and prevent the kind of landmark decision that would protect areas like this. Oh, absolutely. And every, I mean, all the big mining companies want to block this decision. It is heartening that there are civic structures there to provide this kind of protection to where there is a way to stop the rampant corruption, but it is going to rely on the right decision getting made. You know, it's complicated. You to come back to corruption a little bit. You know, the fellow who was responsible for overseeing the distribution of these mining concessions, the previous vice president, uh, Victor Glass, uh, he was also responsible for overseeing these oil concessions in the Amazon. Last year? It was the year before last. I think it was last year. He was convicted of corruption, removed from office, and thrown in jail for taking wow. millions of dollars of bribes from big oil companies in the distribution of the of oil course. concessions. Of course. And of and of course, there hasn't been an, an investigation into the distribution of these mining concessions yet. You know, all the documents are closed, confidential, no access. It's totally a black box how these particular companies got these particular concessions. But I do know part of what's, what's kicked this off, and one of the things that is the most hopeful in terms of this Supreme Court case, when this first happened in 2017, when the mining concessions came down on Los Edros, we worked our tails off to put together an open access, peer-reviewed publication on the potential impact of mining concessions in these protected areas on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And specifically, we put together lists of endangered species at Los Cedros at, and then at three other uh, reserves in northern Ecuador. And that list of endangered species, which is now part of the scientific record published in the Journal of Tropical Conservation Science is one of the primary pieces of evidence being used in this court case. So that is an example of academic and really activist pressure you're able to put on the situation. Exactly. Science is activism. And that's my whole, like, that's, that's what I want for my career. I want my science to be always tied to something activistic. That paper, incidentally, the mining companies are listening. Biddy, who is the first, the primary author on that paper, my advisor, and me were visited in Eugene, Oregon, at the University of Oregon, by this guy named Ben Mace, who is the CEO of BHP's operations in Ecuador. BHP is an Australian mining company and is the largest mining company in the world. Oh, they, my. they own concessions all over that part of Ecuador, including one concession with like a tiny corner that bops into Los Cedros. And that paper about endangered species got their attention enough to get him to fly specifically from Quito to Eugene with a wow. secretary for a two-hour meeting with us, where he basically tried to bribe us. He basically was like, we need to do this kind of work for you know due diligence, and we could fund you really well if you wanted to do it for us. And here's the findings that you would have from that research right in my hand here. That's, yeah, not, you know, that was the vibe I was getting. Um, yeah. He was, you know, and a funny thing, he's, he's Australian because the company's Australian, ex special forces. Oh, so military kind of a guy. scary vibe around him, I'm sure. Oh my God. You can Google him up as much as you want. Ben Mace, there's nothing there. 
he's like scrubbed off the internet. You know, it's intimidating how little there is about him in the world. And yet he's at the head of one of the world's largest mining companies operations in one of the most untapped wealthiest mining nation. Like Ecuador is estimated to have more gold under the ground than any of the other nations that are still mining gold. It's like, there's a reason that these big mining companies are interested in Ecuador. Ecuador has not had large scale mining in the way that Colombia or Peru has had. Part of what makes this such a historic moment in Ecuador, because this is the moment where the, the people of Ecuador really get to decide, do they want the kind of just rape of the landscape that has happened in Peru and in Colombia? That was my next question was how the people felt about this. Now, I don't know their political structure. If they have a similar dichotomy of kind of progressive conservative, there'll be conservative people saying, well, we need mining and we need that gold for jobs. And you know, the progressives saying, well, we can't recreate nature and this is one of a kind on the planet. And, you yep. know, is, is it something similar like that? It's very similar to that. And it, it depends on who you talk to. And one of the yeah. things that's been really interesting working on this movie is that I've gotten the chance to talk to people from kind of lots of different walks of life. The world is changing. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. We have globalization and industrialization, and it's changing ways of life in rural Ecuador in ways that nobody could could have predicted 20 years ago, 30 years ago. One of the consequences of that is that these kind of rural agrarian communities that used to have a little bit of contact with the outside world sometimes, but didn't need it. They grew everything they needed. They lived relatively isolated, but by all measures, pretty contented lives. Uh, And I visited some of these communities. We went to an indigenous village called uh, La Union, where you had to walk for hours to get to the village. And it's it's incredible. It was, you know, I wish I was still there. (laughs) But there are places where it used to be that Everybody was farmers, everybody's friends with their neighbors, everybody traded. Uh, you know, you had some goods that went out to the city on mules, and all of that's changed. You know, it's like you can't really get by in the world without a, a cell phone now, without uh, various Internet, things. Internet, Wi-Fi. The things that you have to spend money on. Yeah. You can't trade your agricultural produce for them mm-hmm. uh, in the way that, you know, th- even even 30 years ago, you could. That's led to villages that never needed jobs in a traditional sense. Now they do. And it's not like you could just choose to go back to the way it was before, which, you know, was hard on a lot of people. Don't get me wrong. That was a a really rough life for a lot of people. Right. But the economy has changed, and that change is being really felt in this, you know, this mining issue. And so when you go into these rural communities, depending on the community, it's split between communities where there's a lot of people that are really interested in agriculture and are making their livelihoods from agriculture, particularly in regions where you can grow coffee and chocolate. Sure, then, sure. You know, export agriculture. Yeah. Um, there's a large group of agriculturalists who really recognize that the water contamination that will be caused by mining in this region uh, will absolutely destroy their livelihoods. There are even from mineral exploration, the next valley over from Los Cedros, the Junin Valley, there has been mineral exploration there and resistance to mining companies for decades. Uh, and there was an incident where a test drilling site hit a gra- like an aquifer and contaminated water flooded the river and mules that drank from the river while it was being flooded from this aquifer died. Like the water was so contaminated that anything, all the fish floated, you know, belly up, like everything died. That was the primary source of water for all of the people living along that river. And now nobody can, you can't drink. It's not as, it's not so bad. It'll kill you immediately, but you can't drink from it. It's not drinkable water. That transition from subsistence to a more industrialized society, like you said, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, but I like to hope that people have learned from kind of the failed Western European model that is hyper commercialization is the natural (laughs) output of that transition. And it's like, I hope they can learn from our mistakes and I hope they can realize that there are 
mostly going to be economic harms and the economic benefits that are going to come from things like mining concessions, which I brought up that specter that I figured must have been thrown around as like jobs, progress. It's like that's going to be oh, yeah. isolated to mostly people that aren't even from Ecuador. You guys are going to get the that's... lowest benefit. You're going to be lowest on the totem pole when it comes to economic benefit from this kind of, of intrusion and extraction. I mean, I hope that people can really learn that lesson. And it sounds like there is some grassroots resistance to this. Well, there's, there is incredible grassroots resistance to it. You know, like I said, we, we've been working with a number of, uh, of groups. In particular, there's a, there's a group called Omazne, uh, which is the, uh, I always forget, it's an acronym for the Observatorio Mineral y Ambiente. Omazne. Observatorio Mineral y Ambiente Social de Nortueste de Ecuador. <laughs> That's a mouthful of an acronym, but the Mining Observatory for the Environment, for the you know, social and the environment uh, in northern Ecuador. So basically it's a watchdog group. It's a nonprofit yeah. watchdog group in northwest Ecuador. We were working with them. They're one of the sponsors for this film. And then there's a group called Decoin, Decoin, which is see, defense and defensive ecology in the Intag Valley. The Intag Valley is the valley next from, next one over from Los Cedros, uh, where they've been fighting mining going back into the 80s with the Japanese mining company, Vichy Metals. They're the ones that have experienced this water contamination, and uh, it's an ag agrarian community. Those groups and others like them in Ecuador, the Caminantes Collective, there's, there's all these grassroots support for this, like, wait, you know, Ecuador right now, globally, Ecuador is known as one of the biodiverse, most biodiverse countries in the world. Per square mile, it is the most biodiverse country in the world. It has the highest concentration of endangered species. The potential for tourism, for development through forest products. We were talking about drug development, drug discovery. The potential for a slower economic development that has the potential to be much more sustainable and in the long run, much greater is there in Ecuador. And that's kind of like the people who are on the ground fighting against mining in Ecuador recognize that. That's the argument really is that like, Hey, mining gives us a really short term infusion of cash that mostly goes to big international corporations that aren't even based in Ecuador. And like, when why would you want to give Ben Mace a new car or whatever when a slower kind of economic development using resources native there won't have that same uh, yeah. extractive and effect. I, I hope it can diffuse that argument because that's something really important that as I've talked to more and more people, you've just verbalized it beautifully, is that idea that these natural systems have such untapped value. And this concept you just threw out about ecosystem services, that's something we are just if I'm understanding, we're just in the early days of truly understanding the scope of ecosystem services provided oh, by these natural systems. And I really hope that can start to diffuse this argument that is always the argument for this kind of practice, which is progress, jobs, we need these things. It's like, no, it doesn't even make sense economically. There's been some really good work done showing that the initial development, if you open a mine, the initial economic development is, of course, much faster than sort of an ecotouristic model. Um, right. But in the long run, the lifespan of these mines is often 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years if you're lucky. And then the mine closes, and what are you left with? And historically, regions of the world that have built their economies on mining, you know, look at parts of Peru are a great example. Huge or, parts of the U.S. Huge, I mean, well, I'm from Appalachia, right? Yeah, I grew yeah. up in the old coal fields that are no longer coal mines. And it's the most economically depressed parts of the United States are the places that used to be mines. You know, people call it extractive and they think they mean extracting from the mountains. But what they don't realize is that it's extractive and that it's taking the wealth out of the country, out of the, out of the region. And so like, it is true that Ecuador's government is in a lot of debt. National finances in Ecuador are a problem. They saddled themselves with the U.S. dollar during an, ac mm. an economic crisis. This is one of the reasons that the pandemic has really an impacted our film is because the pandemic is impacting mining. The you might have heard that the price of oil has just dropped out 
because of the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Tra- you know, global travel is at an all-time low. Nobody's buying oil. In Ecuador, the price of crude oil, oil per barrel went from like 20-something dollars a barrel to literally zero dollars a barrel. They're giving Couldn't it away. Couldn't sell it. Wow. They're, you can't sell it. And oil is Ecuador's primary export. And so the government is leaning into mining as the solution for that. They say, mm-hmm. well, you know, we need, as a, a nation, to support our economy, we need an export. Which isn't wrong, right? It's a, a rock and a hard place situation. And the, the solution would have been not to become reliant on oil exports in the first place, but you can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? I mean, uh, God forbid some of these international financiers forgive debt for countries, but you know, that's a whole oh, other man. conversation. That's, oh, that's, and you know, you might have heard about the, you know, we're experiencing incredible social unrest in the U.S. right now. In October, Ecuador was experiencing incredible unrest because the International Monetary Fund, which is this big, you know, it's like where the loans to countries come from. It's this big group of, you know, international powerful countries basically said to Ecuador, to the government, if you don't impose severe austerity measures on your population so that you can repay these international loans, we're going to just pull all of your loans and you're going to go into default. And so the government's response was, you know, incredible austerity measures, including removing subsidies on gasoline for poor farmers, firing public health care workers, all of these things. And the nation rioted. There's just mass protests everywhere. Ecuador went back on most of the austerity measures, but they still fired thousands of healthcare workers in October in response to perfect demands. timing. Exactly because of the International Monetary Fund, that whole class of banking pirates, <laughs> which is the modern day, you know, the modern day conquest is economic. And in having conversations even about the unrest that we're having here in the U.S. with the black community being unfairly treated in so many ways by institutionalized prejudice in the U.S., I can't help but see one of the core core factors as also a kind of economic conquest you know oh, there's absolutely you can trace it tanahashi Coates is a is a great you know if, you, if you're looking for resources on these things the roots of racial injustice in the united states are capitalism <laughs> it's like yeah. like so much injustice comes down really to wealthy people trying to get more wealthy the way they've been doing all the way back to the kind of roots of capitalism during the colonial period. And slavery and colonialism never really ended. They just put on a fancy suit and moved into banking. That that's what it seems like. Absolutely. And it's, I cross your fingers and, and hope with everything that you can hope that the unrest and the protests that are going on right now in the U S make a difference. It's time, you know, it's like we have these systems of systemic injustice the schools to prison pipeline, the way that black people in this country are treated by the systems of justice and the systems of schooling, you know, like all of these systems are built around extracting labor and resources from the black community at the expense of the black community. Like the roots of those problems that are causing such unrest here in the U.S., are the same as the roots of the problems that are leading to the marginalization of indigenous people and poor rural campesinos in Ecuador. It's the same capitalistic, like extraction of resources from poor marginalized communities for the benefit of this kind of wealthy upper class. And the brutality of the economics stems from largely the, the deceptive nature of economic offers made to these communities where they're not fully informed about negative effects they're not fully informed so we're seeing that choice you know yeah yeah well and we're seeing that and and i brought up that idea of you know why can't the imf cancel these loans if if we really wanted to help why could they cancel loans same thing goes for the u.s with the black community that was one of my big things absolutely why is there wells fargo reparations you know wells fargo and bank of america want to post you know instagram images and that's fantastic how about you do a credit reset on these communities how about you cancel old debts for these communities i mean how about you give people that ever so important equality of opportunity unfortunately when we see for all the great things western european culture has created 
with these different economic tools, how about we give communities that aren't white Western Europeans the same equality of opportunity in that system instead of having to have them be like the short straw drawers every time that end up powering the rest of the people to rise ever higher. And that's beautifully, beautifully illustrated in this idea of Mr. Mace and his Australian company, these folks at Cornerstone Capital Resources coming in and exploiting an economically weakened country by kind of a different hand of the exact same system that's behind both the IMF and these mining companies. One hand weakens them and calls them this debt, and then the other hand's there to swoop in and take any real wealth that they have. It's, yeah. I'm glad you're colonialism this, at its heart. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you're bringing this story to the forefront. And I love that the tools that you're employing are science. I mean, this is something that we don't think of when we think of scientists. We don't necessarily think of, no, this could be a form of activism. And because we are in a world that's changing, I don't think science can be a political. I don't think it ever has been, but I don't think it can, it can try to be a political anymore. No, exactly. You know, I think that there's an image, it, it could have a public perception of scientists, you know, a white lab coat and a dispassioned, pure logic, I don't get involved kind of image. It's not real. It's never been really real. And it's less real now than it ever has been. And I think there have been at least a couple of generations of scientists that have bought into that image and have felt that they haven't really, you know, they can provide information, but they get, you know, like, honestly, we're being honest, we're called boomer mm -hmm. scientists. There's a, but, you know, there's, <laughs> the, there's a certain, there's a certain class of scientists that feel like it's undignified to wade into political discourse. And I think that's wrong. You're at the forefront of amazing discoveries about life on this planet. Who is more relevant in being part of the political arena than people are, who are at the bleeding edge of discovering what this place is and maybe why we're here? And I mean, those are the political voices we need that give huge insights. We were talking before the podcast about that idea that the biological conception of competition versus cooperation, you know, that whole idea mm -hmm. of leaving, leaving fungi out of early education and just sticking with animals and plants and kind of centering it around competition. When you leave out this whole kingdom of life that shows us that cooperation is a viable biological method to survive and a bi valid biological yeah. purpose, if you will, that little example illustrates how important culturally and societally scientific insight is. So we need those exactly. voices. Well, you know, we don't emphasize competition over cooperation in our early childhood education about biology because of anything but culture, right? right? It's like, you know, we could just as easily have a culture that overemphasizes the role of cooperation and really downplays the role of competition in biology. You know, maybe that would be a better society. You I know? would like to err on that side. Right, exactly. I think that's one of the things that we... We don't do a very good job as a society of recognizing the way that our cultural framework influences what we pass on to the next generation and how that influences the cultural framework that they pass on to the next generation. I think that scientists who are more willing, like yourself, to enter the political foray are going to lend us invaluable insights. I mean, how many times have we talked about leaders who don't seem to understand basic science, right? So <laughs> we need these invaluable insights. And then it will make science seem less dogmatic. That's a big thing where people see science, including myself sometimes, see science as this dogmatic, almost a religion unto itself, inflexible and unmoving. And if, man, if we humanize it, bring it into the political arena, people are going to have a much better relationship with it, even if they don't fully understand it. And like I said, those insights are going to play a critical role in making smarter decisions as a society. What good is science if it's not helping us all make better decisions for how we live together? Absolutely. That's one part of it. But then we've talked about the movie, but I do want to point out that Marrow of the Mountain is another form of activism, integrating science that you're doing to help fight some of these huge systemic issues we're, we're talking about. I'm so excited for this film and it's, you know, it's been a journey and it will continue to be a journey, but it's going to be incredible. And it started, it started out that National Geographic expedition that brought all these scientists up. It started out as we earmarked a little bit of money from our initial budget to bring down uh, Dylan, who's the director of the film, to just sort of document this big biodiversity push, uh, thinking we'd make like a short film and some like promotional pieces out of it. And then 
as soon as Dylan got down there and started, you know, we started like sussing out other colleagues through some friends of friends. We, you know, that's how we connected with our Ecuadorian, you know, we're like, I don't know any filmmakers in Ecuador. And so we asked around from some of our Ecuadorian scientist colleagues who connected us with some of our, with Solange and, and Anto, who are our Ecuadorian side of the filmmaking project. And we got down there and started filming, you know, on the expedition and realized we don't just need a film about a scientific expedition, a short film. We need a movie about mining in Ecuador and people. And so it's this expedition to the heart of the rainforest is central to the film, but it's not a, it's not a science documentary. It's not a, it's not like a BBC nature, David Attenborough kind of thing, you know? <laughs> it's really a human focused film. And we're, we're focusing on these three women. So there's, there's three central characters to the movie. The first of them is Elisa Levy. Elisa Levy is the research coordinator for Preserva Los Cedros. Uh, she's also one of the founding members of Omazne, this mining watchdog group oh, yeah. in northern Ecuador. She's a scientist. She works on butterflies, on Lepidoptera. She is just such a powerhouse of activism and science. Uh, she's in her early 30s, so that's our first character. And so we follow her up to the expedition. She helped organize it. She did, actually, she did so much to make that expedition. It couldn't have happened without her. The next character is Isabel Anangono, who is an older black lady who's a farmer living in the Intag Valley, which is the part of Ecuador that's had the longest history of mining resistance. She has been fighting mining her whole life. When she was, I think, eight years old, her parents basically sold her into servitude to work for a wealthy family as a house servant. Uh, she brewed illegal moonshine and, like, you know, ran it on mules out of the valley to the city uh, as a younger woman. Now she owns a farm with her husband. Okay, officially uh, my new hero. Oh my God, she's in crutch. She wrote a book. I can send it to you if you're interested. Yes, uh, isn't please. Isabella Nangano? She's one of our. She's one of our main characters. She's such a badass. I love her. And then the third main character is this woman, Filomena Rosero. Filomena is a leader in the indigenous Awa community. The Awa are the indigenous group that's kind of. They're one of the closest to Los Cedros. They're up on the Colombian border. And they initially, 70% of their land was included in mining concessions without any kind of consultation or, or consent in 2017. And there were huge protests. Indigenous groups had the brunt of these new concessions in 2017. Indigenous communities got together last year, organized this wild march on Quito. They had a sit-in in the president's lawn for days. Uh, until finally, the president of Ecuador came out and he talked to the president of the Confederated Tribes of the Amazonian region, and they rescinded a number of concessions on indigenous land, including many of the concessions in the Awa territory. But there's never been an official announcement of which concessions were rescinded. They just took them off of the map, but the mining companies are still active inside of the indigenous territory. We took a tour while we were in the indigenous territory of sites that have been just, I mean, the, the devastation is absurd. There's places where this beautiful river that runs through pristine, uh, it's lower than a cloud forest, but this incredible rainforest habitat, this huge river, and both banks of the river have just been torn to shreds by extractive mining. They're basically coming in and digging up the banks, one of the things that, that you do in mining is you put all this material into a what's called a tailings pond. It settles out and it's all you dig up all this toxic stuff. And so you, you're walking along this beautiful, pristine river. And then suddenly here's this scummy oil ridden tailings pond with obviously contaminated water just like leaking into the river. That's the drinking water for these people. And all of this is in the gray area between the government saying, oh yeah, we're going to rescind those concessions and actually making a formal statement. They're living in the middle of that area, exactly. making tailing ponds and destroying the environment. I mean, that just seems heinously criminal. Yeah, no, it's absurd. Yeah, so Filomena is an, a leader in this indigenous community who's been organizing against mining in the Awa. And the Awa as a people, are really clear. They do not want mining on their land. One of the things we're going to be doing in this movie that I'm really excited about is contrasting the form of government that is used within the indigenous group that we're focusing on, the Awa, and the form of government as it's implemented for the nation of Ecuador. Because they call it the Gran Familia Awa, the Great Family. 
the process by which leaders and decisions are made in the Awa is much more, you know, there's a lot of consensus, there's a lot of groups come together and they just talk it out. You know, we went to some community meetings that lasted for literally all day. You'd think like, oh, we're going to have a community meeting and it's going to be a couple of hours. And it's like, no, these people, everybody engages because everybody gets a voice. And it's incredible to witness. And so we'll be talking about that in the film. The Awa people have been very clear that they do not want mining. They've experienced the hardships of colonialism as a people um, going all the way back, back to before European colonialism. The Awa were pushed out of their native lands by the Incan Empire into the lands they occupy now. And then during European colonization, their lands were bisected. The traditional Awa territory actually is on both sides of the Colombian-Ecuadorian border. And so there are Awa that exist in Colombia and Awa that exist in Ecuador. Despite being an independent people, a nation, they can't just cross the border and visit their family on the other side. The Colombian Awa are right in the path of what was the conflict with the FARC. In the last few years, there have been oil spills. During the the conflict with the FARC, there was a massacre. And then who are the FARC, just so... Oh, the FARC FARC are the the revolutionary fighters in southern Colombia. Okay, got it. There's been a peace deal with the FARC in the last couple of years, and they've become a political party, much the way the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, became a political party Mm -hmm. after the peace deal in the late 90s in in Britain. Uh, Examples of people using the threat of force or, you know, however you want to argue that, whether it's defensive force or otherwise, to get a seat at the political table just shows that sometimes that's only the only viable path. Obviously, I'm not condoning or condemning anything, but it is just an illustration of revolution using physical force against governments that maybe that's the only tool or the only thing they recognize suddenly gets you a seat at the political table. It definitely can. And there's, you know, historically, I think there's, it's, it's tricky, but from a sort of a broad historical perspective, those kind of tactics uh, can be very effective. Um, I mean, that's, yeah. that's the origins of the United States of America, right? Right. right. Um, and yeah, so, so it's, it's complicated, but yeah, the, yeah. you know, the Awa, the Awa as a people have definitely taken a, a lot of damage uh, as a result of other people's politics. As a culture, they're, they're, they're a little bit isolationist. They're, they're contained within themselves. Um, and they don't really desire too much. One of the things they want is autonomy. What a which concept. is not, yeah, right? Is, <laughs> is not that much to ask for so that they can decide these things for themselves. Um, and it's something that the colonial powers in, in that part of the world have, have not given them. Uh, whether those colonial powers be the Spanish during the conquest, the Incas before that, or the governments of Ecuador and Colombia after, or the big international extractivist companies, oil and, and minerals, uh, you know, on the capitalistic kind of stage. Uh, and right. So, so we have this movie where we're focusing on these three characters. Uh, and I, I realize I've just talked way more about the Awa than I did the other two, but it'll be relatively balanced in the film. <laughs> the movie is much more balanced than we just went down the rabbit hole. Got it. Well, we did, we did just go down a rabbit hole. Again. But basically, you know, what I want people to take away here is that we're, we're working on a film that hasn't been done before. There's, there has not been a documentary like this. Mm-hmm. We're centering scientific understanding of nature, mining, you know, these issues that are at the heart while taking a social focus. Right. Right. And, you know, the discussion of how do these things impact women in particular is new. Mm-hmm. This has not been done before. There's one of the things that's, that's really telling when you look at economic analyses of mining in regions like this, uh, or mining in general, uh, as opposed to things like ecotourism, mining generates a lot of jobs in the short term, and they're almost all for men. Right. Ecotourism, over the course, you know, ecotourism or this kind of drug discovery or these other like ways that you can monetize these ecosystem services generate jobs basically equally for men and women. Mm. Uh, and that's something that doesn't get talked about very often, but it's really important. Science is a great example. Science generates jobs, much slower rate than mining does. But Elisa being an, an excellent example, it's non-discriminatory. I mean, there's this systemic sexism built into the academic institutions 
that are science, right? There are more men scientists right now than there are women scientists. Right. Uh, but in the, the new generations, they're almost equal. And in fact, in some, in some fields, mycology among them, there are more young women scientists than there are young men scientists. Mycology is also exceptional in having a huge overrepresentation of queer people compared to other scientific disciplines. Mycology is also notable in having an extreme lack of representation of people of color. It's a very white field. And so, you know, there, there are definitely things we need to work on as a field. But it's, it is encouraging to know that there are some, in some ways, like we are making progress. You know, that's the thing is we, we always have to be like celebrate the victories and fight like hell for the people that are, that need it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I just applaud what you guys are doing so much. That really touched me hearing that angle where it's not only just the idea of keeping that economic benefit within the Ecuadorian community with preventing the destruction of invaluable and irreplaceable natural habitat, but also the fact that the only argument against it, that economic argument severely uh, favors men over women. There's just so many angles to this thing where it seems obvious to any rational human what the answer is. And I'm just glad that you're using, you know, rational thought, documentary, dramatic filmmaking, and science as tools in your toolkit to help expose this issue. Uh, now, where can people support the film? Where can people find you and your work, find the film? Like, let's promote, let's promote the hell out of this thing so people can get behind it. Yeah. Well, the first resource for the film and the place to go for, for everything, the film is called Marrow of the Mountain and the website is marrowofthemountain.com. Uh, and it's, you know, there'll be new up to date information on that website as it happens. Uh, the big thing we're working on right now, we, like you said at the beginning of this interview, uh, I just got back to the U.S. I was in Ecuador specifically to work with the film, not a science trip this time, a filming trip. Well, we were in Ecuador for three months. We spent about six weeks filming. We visited all three of our main characters. We spent Carnival up at Los Cedros with a bunch of scientists <laughs> and members of Omagne, that nonprofit group. Uh, and then we, we spent a bunch of time in the Intag Valley with Isabel and working with mining defenders, but also touring around and talking to women who are pro-mining, who are really needed those jobs, you mm. know, who can bring that perspective that like we are mothers, wives and daughters in communities where economics of the region have shifted. And, you know, it used to be you could make a perfectly decent living running cattle and you can't anymore. And we need these jobs because our sons can't go to school because we don't have the money to fix the road in the community to get the bus to the where the school is two hours down the road wow the practical it, side of of that oh argument God. as well and it's not you know i realize we're, we're talking about this in a, a pretty anti-mining way um, sure. but it's it's not clear-cut it's not simple these yeah. are hard decisions that people have to make the benefits and the costs and that's something that we are really concerned about treating seriously in this film and one of the things that's impacted the, this film and this issue tremendously is the coronavirus pandemic. Ecuador is the hardest hit country in Latin America. You know, as a percentage, there are more cases and more deaths in Ecuador than anywhere else. And that has had impacts in a number of ways. Uh, one of them is economic. We talked about the, the government of Ecuador has now turned to mining and this mining expansion as the solution to the economic problems that have been caused by the coronavirus pandemic. And that makes this movie so much more urgent. Right. And it also means that we've got more work to do to make this movie because all of the filming we did in Ecuador necessarily happened before the lockdown came down. So we've been doing interviews by Zoom, just like we're doing right now, but we're going to have to travel back to Ecuador. The pandemic interrupted our filming. We never got the chance to travel to the south of the country where the big, the old big mining operations exist. There was mining that was started by the Spanish conquistadors in the south of Ecuador and mining projects that have been going on that whole time. And that's the contrast. We need to visit those mining sites to be able to compare what might happen to the potential mining sites we've been talking about in the north of the country where these new mining concessions at places like the Cedros have come down. 
We didn't get to do that. So it becomes much more urgent with uh, the way that the government has responded to the pandemic. Part of that response has also been total lockdown, strict curfews. The you know I was in the same house for six weeks at the end of my wow. stay in the door. Okay, I did literally did not leave the house. Truly like, locked down. Truly locked down. And the mining companies have used that to accelerate operations because no one's looking, no one's watching. I was going to say it would be really important to get down there and not only see that illustrative example of here's the outcome of the mining projects way down the road, but also see what are the inroads they've made since exactly. this lockdown happened and how it, it no. gets to the character of these companies and what their, oh. what their objectives are. And one of, the, one of the big issues with that is these, because it, you know, it takes skill to operate mining equipment. A lot of the mine workers come in from outside of these rural communities. Mm. Unskilled labor comes from the rural communities. Any kind of skilled labor they bring in from the schools in Quito or they bring in internationally. Right. And there have been documented cases now where because the mines have been allowed to continue operation, mine workers are bringing coronavirus into rural and indigenous villages that are unprepared for an outbreak. It's sometimes days of travel to the nearest hospital. They don't have respirators. They don't have the, the cultural, you know, awareness. In the U.S., we're having a really hard time with social distancing as a culture, right. Right? right? You know, that kind of hard time with these measures to deal with coronavirus exists across lots of different cultures. And in particular, rural and indigenous Ecuadorian cultures are, you know, these are places where you kiss each other on the cheek when you see each other. And mm. it's, it's a tough adjustment. And in the early stages of the pandemic, mine workers ended up bringing coronavirus into really vulnerable populations where they don't have access to health care. They don't have access to transportation. And it's it's an ongoing problem. And so we'll be traveling back to Ecuador. And, and one of the issues with this is, you know, we've changed our story because now we need we really need to cover these coronavirus issues. Yeah. Uh, and we've interrupted the filming that we were doing, which is it's, it's a cost, right? We're going to require another trip to Ecuador that we weren't expecting. Uh, and so we're running a Kickstarter. We're running a crowdfund, emergency COVID uh, relief Kickstarter, so that we can make Marrow of the Mountain actually happen. And so you can find that on Kickstarter. Uh, if you type in Marrow of the Mountain, it'll come right up. And I, I'm actually really excited about that for a number of reasons. One of them being that we're working with the famous Ecuadorian street artist, Ache, who does absolutely incredible uh, work. He's mostly known for his graffiti work in Quito, but he's doing graphic design for us for the posters and other rewards uh, available as part of this Kickstarter. So if you want sweet swag, this is a good opportunity. Oh, there's no downside. Well, there's no, there's no downside. Exactly. Support good cause, get sweet swag. Everyone has that natural impulse, <laughs> especially people who love mushrooms, love foraging, are nature files. We all want to help when we hear situations like this. I mean, there's almost this frustration in modern society where we're more globally connected than ever, more globally aware, especially when it comes to injustice. We feel that righteous fury, but then sometimes we feel disconnected from any way to help. So it's like you're being made aware of all these things and you don't have the tools at your disposal to, to really make a, a difference. And that's why I want to really encourage people to support what you're doing because it is giving a voice and an alternative viewpoint to the existing government kind of standard operating procedure that's prevailing right now. And I appreciate you guys have tried to be balanced and really show from local communities that, yes, there is a, an argument for mining, but I think we need to see this viewpoint coming from the local community, both for and against and all the negative externalities that support the argument against mining. So I really, really, really encourage people to support this. I will be putting up links on the website, on Instagram bios, obviously on the bottom of this podcast for people to get involved and support something that is, is important socially, important when it comes to global biodiversity. Yeah, absolutely. And the stakes, you can't really understate the stakes here. And this film is, I mean, this is one of my ways of, of really like contributing in the, the best ways that I know how. And I think, you know, the Ecuadorian government has over the course, you know, if you look at the last 20 years of history, the government is maybe not as afraid of its own people as it should be, but they mm. respond really well to political pressure on the international stage. One of the reasons that, that we, you know, we're not making this movie in a vacuum, right? We're making right. this movie interfacing with the pro-biodiversity 
anti-mining or sensible mining campaigns that are going on in Ecuador and internationally. We're working with Mining Watch Canada, which is the big mining watchdog NGO in Canada, oh, because the mining company at Los Cedros is Canadian. Yeah. We're working with the Rainforest Information Center, which is a rainforest conservation group in Australia, part of a coordinated international campaign to try to save these rainforests. You know, the stakes aren't just Los Cedros. We're talking about this constitutional court case that has the potential to impact millions of acres of protected lands in Ecuador. And the government of Ecuador, including the constitutional court, uh, has a much higher probability of taking it really seriously if there's noise on the international stage. And that's where this movie comes in. This is the international pressure on Ecuador to really do the right thing. And it's like, if you're going to push for mining development, do it in a way that's not going to be building mines on protected forests. That's not going to be building mines in the headwaters of the rivers that people get their drinking water out of. Do it in a way that's not going to be in putting endangered species at increased risk of extinction. And even cynically for the government and the politicians there, this is in your best interest. You could easily become incredibly popular politicians by finding some kind of middle ground here, a road to some kind of economic benefit without the local populations being the ones that bear the brunt of these horrible environmental and, and social damages. And I just put down a list of some of the tools I was thinking of in the new kind of activist toolkit, change maker toolkit, political toolkit, and that's documentary showcasing. You know, we all know how effective documentary films in can be an instigating mm -hmm. change. It's an incredibly powerful medium. Crowdsourcing funding, that hasn't been available in the same way as it has been in the last even five years. It's yeah, totally absolutely. changed the way for people to empower independent change makers. Science, the use of science to demonstrate points and give an irref not irrefutable, but to give but, an incredibly strong but, viewpoint. To, to come to these arguments with empirical evidence. Yes, rooted yeah. in something that's more than something like emotion or more than righteous anger, as great as that feels, to root it in something that's even more empirical, like you said. And then this other critical element of international pressure. When the world's watching, people suddenly find their conscience, even if it's just everyone else's conscience, invading their their <laughs> perception. Yeah, absolutely. It's the internet in particular has has really changed the game on that. You can't keep things in the dark in the way you used to. You used to be able to. And it's and that's wonderful. But also leaves us open to misinformation and the way I, we all heard about it in the US about like Russian interference in the twenty sixteen election campaign. But this is something that is actively going on with mining companies in regard to this issue as well. There is misinformation that is being expertly produced by people with tons of money to just flood and try to overwhelm anybody who's trying to really find out the answers to these questions. You're like, you know, should I support mining because jobs and local populations? Or should I, you know, like be anti-mining because of biodiversity and ecosystem services? And how do you juggle these things? And there's propaganda. I that wouldn't be surprised if Ben Mace is funding some nice ads all around Facebook with people saying, hey, we need mining in this community or something like that. I would not be surprised. Yeah, at all. we've already had a, an instance of um, for the group making this film, one of our yeah. emails being hacked and like trolley emails being sent out to all of our contacts. You know, it's like there's no proof, but we suspect this is, you know, part of uh, an effort to undermine the creation of this film. I mean, these mining companies are very wealthy and very powerful. And there's, you know, in Ecuador, anti-mining activists have faced, um, I know people personally who have been disappeared by the government, kept at black sites. It took the involvement of Amnesty International to get one person we know released, held for a year, never charged. Like it, It's the scary legacy of different South American and Central American governments that get unduly influenced or taken over or pressured by corporate interests, especially that unholy alliance of governments and outside corporate interests combine. And, and unfortunately, there is a track record of that in South America. So I'm not, I'm not surprised to hear that. And I did have as one of my big questions, if you guys were facing that kind of trickery and that kind of, you know, bad actors getting involved against you. And, uh, 
I'm not surprised. And it's all the more reason why people listening, if they resonate with this, should really support you guys and give you a boost, kind of power of the people boost to help make this thing come into fruition in a really powerful way. I guess through this whole experience of you working in Los Cedros, I mean, your whole body work, both as a scientist and now as an activist and a documentarian, what is the connection that you feel to this area and and how has this effort kind of animated your life or, or has it given you like more purpose and animated you? Since the very first time I went to Ecuador, to Los Cedros, as a graduate student, with this little project that I thought would be a side project to my main dissertation, I got pulled in. I have never been anywhere else on the planet like Los Cedros. I grew up in the military. I traveled all over. I've done field work on three continents. Uh, you know, like to say that Los Cedros is special is the understatement of the century. Once you've been there, you can't help but to want to work to protect it. And if you're working to protect Los Cedros, you're working to protect life yeah. because it's all part of the same we exist as part of this this system that is this global biosphere and you start to recognize the ways that you know a malfunction or a destruction of one part of it is damaged to all of it and i think that's something that we as scientists and as concerned citizens something that we we really have to reckon with is this idea that as we work to protect the environment, you can't just be interested in conserving one habitat or one thing that's dear to your heart. That can be central, but it can't be all because it's all part of the same whole. Yeah. And it sets precedence, even if it's not the same country, but you start exactly. setting precedence by the ability of activists to protect places like this. And in that all important quest, I mean, you just describe the quest to defend the life and defend biodiversity every fight becomes important, becomes a landmark, especially against the backdrop of a couple centuries where that has been driven over, where biodiversity has been completely inconsequential to a majority of the driving forces of the culture. Now every activist fight in defense of biodiversity becomes incredibly, incredibly important. So with this huge work that's now taking over your life, rightfully so, I usually ask people about future plans. Do you have anything like books or anything on the horizon besides this amazing work that everyone should support? Is there anything else on the horizon for you? Yeah, and that's the coronavirus has definitely changed, I think, the way people are looking at future career prospects, for mm -hmm. sure, uh, myself among them. Up until this, I had kind of assumed I would do the normal, like, academic, get a job, like, be a professor somewhere. And now something like a third of the state is unemployed and, you know, nobody's hiring. And it's like, well, yeah. where to from here? But, you know, I take it as it comes. But I don't really mind because I've got so much to do from the biodiversity work at Los Cedros. You know, we're still working on, I think, three or maybe four individual scientific papers. And I would love for one of the end results of that to be a guidebook to fungi mushrooms of Los Cedros. That's a mm -hmm. popular guidebook, not a scientific checklist or anything. That's one that's like kind of pipe dream status at the moment, but starting. There is art in my life. Anybody who follows me on social media has, has seen that while I was in quarantine in Ecuador, I've been pumping out fungal design work. And so I've got plans, not super fixed plans, but now I'm back in the States to finalize some products with some of those designs and get an Etsy store going. So I'll see my you. fiance will be incredibly excited. She it wants mushroom prints like are on your instagram more than anything floral prints they're everywhere animal prints they're everywhere but where why are, are the great mushroom prints right no exactly that, and then that's part of my motivation for sure tea towels fabrics i don't know we'll see i want wallpaper personally yes i think that would be it. so much fun so that's one the other big project that's been keeping me going while i've been in quarantine i've been writing a book a couple of years ago, I wanted to give a book introducing Ink Fungi uh, to a friend of mine's 11-year-old daughter. So I started looking around and asking around and realized there isn't anything. The number of children's books about fungi that are available in the world right now, like I can count them on all 10 of my fingers, basically. Yeah, I yeah. mean, this, And so part of it was, it was a friend of mine who teaches fifth grade at a Waldorf school. 
And there's a, there's a book that Waldorf uses as a resource is written by a, an old friend of Rudolf Steiner named Dr. Grumman back in Germany in the 1920s. It's a book they still use back when fungi were considered lower plants. So my friend sent it to me a couple of years ago thinking, Oh, this has a whole chapter on mushrooms and fungi. And my friend Rue is going to love it. And they sent it to me and I read it and I was horrified. <laughs> it, it like absolutely embodies the worst aspects of Western European fungiphobia I have ever seen. Quote from the book, I kid you not, is it any wonder that so many mushrooms are poisonous or they do not let the light of the sun shine through them? It sounds very scientific. It's, oh my God. <laughs> it's so, so I was like, all right, I can do better. Two years ago, I wrote a short, what would be like a, you know, a chapter in a kid's book about the carbon cycle and the great breathing of the earth. Plants exhale oxygen. They bring in the carbon dioxide. They create biomass, basically. And then something has to get that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And that's the function. And so I, I kind of wrote that as like a tongue in cheek response to this terrible chapter on fungi from this book. And this idea has been kicking in the back of my head to write a kid's mycology book that could be used in schools, but would also be interesting to read for just set of science minded kids. And I just last week finished. Uh, and so I'm in conversation with a couple of literary agents right now, and I've been talking with an absolutely incredible illustrator. Uh, everybody's like, Rue, you should illustrate it yourself. I'm right. Like, My illustrations, I think, are not the right illustrations for kids' books. So I'm working with an illustrator named Jamie Green. You can find her on Instagram, uh, Jamie Green. She's absolutely phenomenal. She did her thesis on fungi. She herself is an amateur mycologist. And her style of illustration is exactly the right thing for a kid's book about fungi. It's going to be incredible. You know, I haven't really shared it around much. It's been this very private project for me for the last few months. But now that I have this manuscript, like a full manuscript, sitting, staring at me, and I, I'm starting to feel like, oh, gee, I should tell people about this. <laughs> oh, uh, please. This needs to get out in the world. I already hear mushroom-loving parents that I know listen to this show just freaking out that there's going to be a great children's book describing mushrooms. Like, this is something we absolutely need. I've often talked with people that, you know, I wish I was introduced to mushrooms earlier in my life. We all acknowledge that the lack of representation, if you will, of fungi in scientific literature, especially in younger education. We talk about elementary school, middle school. It's so obvious. It's like, yes, we need more and more material showing people how amazing fungi can be. And that is going to change the next generation's understanding of life on the planet and get people more used to mushrooms and really start building upon the work that we've already done in a whole new way when they're, when they're introduced to it throughout their whole life. So Wow, what an amazing, <laughs> important project. I'm so excited for you. It's going to be super exciting. And, I, you know, and that's what we were talking earlier about the ways that concepts of competition versus cooperation is taught in biology and how that influences culture uh, and the ways that fungi approach sex being this, you know, non binary and really different. Yeah. And like, you know, these things influence the culture of the next generation. As a queer person, I view fungi through this lens that is, I think, kind of different than a lot of sort of mainstream sort of straight white science. And I think that's one of the things I learned in my philosophy of science course way back was that the diversity of viewpoints in scientific investigation is absolutely essential to the scientific process. And I think it's really important to the ways that fungi queer traditional concepts in biology, everything from their reproductive biology to their propensity for coordinated mutualistic symbiosis is really important knowledge to put into the hands of interested children. Well, you know, my only wish is that we can clone Rue and make about 10 Rue Vandergriffs to start making movies and making books and really continually changing the planet and moving things forward. I just thank you for taking this much time to spend with us and share all your projects and be really open and dive into some of these topics. There's a lot of bravery and a lot of humility and uh, yeah, just really, really leaving this conversation so hugely inspired. And I think a lot of people will. A couple final thoughts that I like to ask everyone. 
Okay. Um, what is a mushroom that you love and why? This doesn't have to be a favorite. It could be something from Ecuador. It could be something from Oregon. What is a mushroom you love and why? And why should we know about it? Mm, the obvious answer, of course, is Silaria, right? Yeah, of course. Um, of course, right? But maybe that's too, because we already talked about Silaria. So maybe that's too obvious. So I think one that maybe nobody's heard about before. The genus Monkeya. Specifically, there's a there's a fungus called Monkeya martyrus. Monkeya martyrus. Monkeya martyrus. So Monkeya, everybody knows about cordyceps, right? Right. Cordyceps infect insects. So this this group of fungi, the Cordycipitaceae, what used to be all Clavicipitaceae, it's been split. They are known for their host switching. There are fungi in this group that infect plants, like the clavicipitaceous grass endophytes that I worked on early in my dissertation. Uh, and there are fungi that infect insects, like the cordyceps. Monkeya is one that does both. Monkeya is this group of fungi. You find these on bamboo. Next time you're somewhere tropical where there's native bamboo, look at the bamboos and see if you can find fungi that are like round balls at the joints of the bamboo. Monkey is one of these. Probably the most famous of the group is Ascolibra. But monkey is cooler in some ways. <laughs> and so this is a, it's like a cordyceps. It infects a tiny, tiny scale insect and it eats the insect entirely except for its mouth parts. It leaves the mouth parts of the scale insect attached to the bamboo and uses them to suck nutrients out of the bamboo and can grow hundreds of times the size of the insect it initially infected because now it's parasitizing the bamboo in the exact same way that the insect would have been parasitizing the bamboo. Except that it ate the insect. It's taking control of their mandibles and integrating it into its own biology. Exactly. What? How cool is what? that? Okay, so that's this whole, there's this big group of bamboo-associated cordycipitaceous fungi, of which monkey is part of them that work like that. Monkeya martyrus is particularly interesting. It's named by the mycologist, I think it was Sicardo, uh, in the 1800s during political unrest. This is a period in South America when Spain was being kicked out of the country. Mm. And during the course of these violent revolutions, a scientist, a botanist of some, of some note, who's really, whose only crime was that they wanted to keep doing good science, was put to death by one of the revolutionary governments. Mm. And as a statement of protest against the, uh, the oppression of science in the face of revolution, this mycologist named this fungus Monkeya martyrus after his friend who was a martyr for science. Wow, that's powerful. All right, well, that's one I never heard of. And... That's another example of why I'm so glad I asked this question as we learn all the coolest mushrooms this way. <laughs> now, given your whole body of work and you know, all the insights you've developed, what would be your advice to an 18-year-old or just a young Rue? What would be your advice to yourself? Like, get into fungi earlier. I didn't really, I didn't consider myself a, mycology, a mycologist or like really get into fungi and mushrooms until graduate school. I did a lot of ecology in college and, you know, I did soil science and, and it was really like, I feel like I didn't find my calling until I started, not just because like the science is really interesting, but because of the culture around mycology, the, you know, the amateur mycological societies that exist all over the country. What other science has that? When was the last time you went to a, a local amateur ecologist's meeting, an ornithologist's meeting, you know, like there are birder groups, but oh my God, it's not the same thing. Right. right. And that not to despair, I like I've been to some birder groups, they're nice people. It's, it's just different. The way that amateur mycologists, like the society around it, the culture of it, the community of it. I wish I had found that when I was 18 and I'm happy I found it now. Yeah. It is a very inclusive community a very jovial community. There's always exciting things. People always are interesting. It's an increasingly younger community. And like you said, hopefully we'll start seeing it as more of a POC inclusive community as well. I think exactly. there is some underrepresentation there, but I think there are some big ways 
that amateur mycology clubs can be just conscious of that fact and structure their offerings to make this thing more inclusive and, and get more people involved. Mm -hmm. So another monumental question, what is the lasting impact you hope to make uh, with your work, both in science, activism, illustration, children's books? I mean, what is the impact <laughs> that you hope to make on the planet? I mean, I want to make the world a better place. You know, and it's, I, think, I think all of the, everything that I have tried to do, making this film, the kind of biodiversity work, even, you know, things as simple as just describing a, a single new species of mushroom to the world, to put that in a context that's not isolated, to recognize that the science that I do, the activism that I do, that it's, it's connected to this broader world, this children's book that I'm writing. When I'm dead and gone, if people remember me and any of it is something that they can look back and say like, wow, I hope I can have an impact like that, then I'll be happy. If I get to the end and it's like, well, did any of it make a difference? It's like, I tried, you know, that's the, you never succeed if you don't try. All I'm doing is trying the best I can. Much more honor in trying greatly and failing than to never try at all. But thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Obviously, you have a prodigious amount of work ahead of you. You're busy in so many great... So thank you for making the time to be with us and also just to share really earnestly your experience, dive into all the nitty-gritty of these topics and really hope people take inspiration from this like I have. And I also really, really encourage people for the millionth time to support you as much as they possibly can right now uh, if they if they resonate with this and they're interested in this, because I think it is such such an important piece of work that you're doing with with this documentary and really with everything you're doing. So, Ruth, thank you for taking the time to be with us on the Mushroom Hour. This has been absolutely great. Yeah, you're doing good work. You know, you said you you wish there were you there were hundreds of me, and you know, there, but it's I think I'm no different from anybody else out there. There's nothing special that makes me active or activist. We all have the potential to just turn the work we do into something that makes a difference in the world. Uh, and you're doing it right now with this podcast. Everybody listening has, has that potential. We all have the same inherent goodness. Yeah. The world changes because we change. We make it change. Absolutely. Let's turn our acting consciously into activism that instigates change. I love that. I love <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Rue. Well, thank All you right. again for this conversation. All amazing. right, thanks so much. We'll see you next time.